Okay, so uh, we're going to go ahead and, and start the uh, the meeting. I'm going to put the petitioners back into the waiting room, and and when your case comes up, uh, we'll we'll bring you back into the to the meeting. But I want everyone to know that we uh, that we're up and running, and hopefully it stays that way. So with that, I am going to place the appropriate parties in the waiting room, and um, the board can. Give me a moment to do that, and then we can start the uh, commence the meeting. All right. We have everybody here who needs to be here, board members. Okay. Um, I will hand it over to Mr. Ofek to commence our meeting. And let's go under the presumption that we have that 40 minute time frame so board members can be clear and concise tonight in their comments and motions. Sounds good. Yeah. With that, the board, board does not write the zoning ordinance, but does have the authority to grant relief from where practical difficulty or unnecessary hardship would result. The board will vote on each agenda item following the public hearing. Petitioners should try their best to limit the presentation to 10 minutes. Use variance requests require a minimum of six affirmative votes in order to grant the requested variances. Non-use variance requests require a minimum of five affirmative votes in order to grant the variance. In the absence of a full board at tonight's meeting, petitioners have the ability to request that their agenda item being postponed until a future meeting due to a circumstance. Petitioners must inform the vice chairperson after the staff's presentation in the public hearing. Please be, note that we do not have a full board tonight, so therefore, if people would like to delay, they are welcome to do so. Um, let us go with roll call then. We'll start on the upper left. Mr. Moore, please state your here. name and what Travis Moore here, Royal Oak. Mr. Gavin. Robert Gavin here in Royal Oak. Mr. Reddy. Arvind Reddy, president in Royal Oak. Mr. Clatt. Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. Present in Royal Oak. Ms. Zukin. Deborah Zukin, present in Royal Oak. Ms. Robinson. Nancy Robinson, present and in Royal Oak. And I am assuming Ms. Grant is the new member. Okay. Yes, hello, I'm Samantha Grant and I'm also in Royal Oak. Nice hello. to meet you. Hi. Anthony Ofek and I'm also in Royal Oak. And with that, we will start uh, the meeting with the approval of minutes for last month, October 14th. Is there any comments for those uh, minutes? If not, do we have a motion for approval? Mr. Gavin. I move approval. Mr. Clatt seconds, I assume? Yes. We'll go in uh, reverse order this time. Ms. Zukin? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Uh, Ms. Grant, you weren't there last month, so I believe you can't vote on it, correct, Joseph? No, she's able to. Uh, she's able to, okay. to vote a affirmative denial or an abstention. Yes. Okay. Mr. Clatt? Yes. Mr. Reddy? Yes. Mr. Gavin? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Okay. With that, they have been approved. Oh, and I vote yes, of course. Uh, I don't believe we have any unfinished business from last month, so we will move on to new business for this month. The first case is F. 21-11-05. Mr. Murphy, whenever you are ready, sir. I am ready. I'm going to display on the screen some information that I think could be helpful to our conversation. Uh, this property is located at the corner of Hendry and West 4th Street. You can see from the area photographs 
on the screen that the rear yard of this property abuts the public alley across the alley our proper is a property our properties that front along Woodward Avenue and the petitioner has installed an eight foot and I'm going to go to the photographs here they've installed an eight foot tall fence along the rear property line the ordinance allows for a maximum fence height of six feet so the petitioner is you can see this is the fence along forestry and it wraps around uh, adjacent to the alley is where it increases in height to eight feet along the rear side of the alley again the opposite side are businesses on woodward avenue and the, again the maximum height is six feet the petitioner's fence is eight feet so they are here for a variance uh, to waive two feet of that maximum allowable. We did send out public notices and we did not receive any public comment regarding the petitioner's request. The petitioner has provided um, more recently some a graphic that's included on the last page of your screen and they had referenced the height of some nearby property offenses of nearby properties that they feel is, is relevant to their um, request and I believe that they can elaborate on that a little further uh, when we uh, ask that questions of them so if you have any questions of me I'd be happy to answer them all right uh, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Murphy all right seeing none will the petitioner introduce themselves for an address for the record please you're muted <clears throat> Can you hear me now? Yep. Perfect. Uh, Chad Buchanan, 326 Hendry in Royal Oak. And uh, we're right on the corner of uh, 4th and Woodward in, uh, on Hendry. Um, our fence back in early 2020 partially blew down. It was a fence that was well over 20 years old. Um, I was actually the, under the presumption that I had filled out the online portal properly and I got an approval back for, uh, you know, the, the height in the back of the building or, uh, at our fence. Unfortunately, um, it was right when COVID, can you hear me? Okay. Right when COVID first started and you guys were fully virtual. So there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity to communicate with someone there. So I ended up talking with, I believe James or Joseph, and uh, I had realized that I, I needed to go a different route. So <laughs> we had to ask for uh, forgiveness instead of permission, which I highly apologize about. But we only did the back um, and a little bit of larger height just because we're in an alleyway. And the lot behind us that uh, the business has that um, is right uh, up next to Woodward, it you know needs a little bit more... Um, security slash uh, distance between the people that go up and down that lot in the evenings and are in that lot in the evenings. So that's why the back is like that. The side is on 4th Street, sticks six feet, and we actually followed the same footprint as the fi uh, prior fence that was there. We didn't change anything about it. So we just rebuilt 100% what it was prior, but I believe back in the day they didn't follow uh, all the proper rules when they built it. So, thank you. Any questions for the petitioner, Mr. And then Mr. And then Mr. Clapp. I I didn't hear you cut out a little bit on my my audio. Did you ask for me first? Yes. Oh, okay. Was the was the fence uh, along the alley that blew down? Was that eight feet uh, uh, back before it blew down? It was. We rebuilt exactly the same footprint. I didn't realize that prior to that wasn't set that way. So there's actually, there's a height increase in ground level there. I don't know if you can see with the shrubbery, but it's, it's a little, it's a little over like seven and a half feet. I think it's 84 or 85 inches. Something okay. to that effect. But, Thank you. Yes. Okay. Ms. Zukin? Uh, you're muted. Mr. Gavin asked my question. Okay. Mr. Clatt? Yeah. Yours was also the same. Mrs. Robinson. Oh, no, you. Okay. Is there any other questions for the petitioner? All right. Uh, before we 
pull it back to this side and vote. We don't have a full board. We're missing one person. Uh, we could have a full board next month or we might be again short. Would you like us to proceed and uh, discuss and vote or would you like us to uh, delay till next month? What well, depends if everyone passes me or not. Uh, we, can't, <laughs> we can't say one way or no, another. I'm, I'm, I'm totally kidding. Um, okay. I, I think we're fine to have the vote right now. Um, yeah. You know, it, all the houses that are on the same street as us, Henry backing up to Woodward, um, all of the, the, the homes that are right here, they all have the same height fence or taller. So um, I, I think probably be fine to vote now. Okay, thank you. Then we'll pull to this side. And is there any discussion and or motions by anyone? Mr. Moore. I will make a motion to approve. Is there a, a second? second? Ms. Zukin, I see you for the second. Go ahead, Mr. Moore, you may discuss. Um, yeah, this wasn't uncommon along Woodward. I think we've approved uh, eight foot fences in other locations along Woodward in various different times. And so um, I think they were just replacing what they had and um, I understand, you know, the, the mix up with the approvals and everything. So I think it's fine. Ms. Sukin, do you have anything to add? I'll just add that um, I believe there's a practical difficulty in that it does back up to a commercial alley, um, which makes a difference when you're looking at the six foot ordinance. Okay, anyone else? All right. Uh, the only thing I'd say is I, I agree. The practical difficulty I see is this is against the commercial alley of Woodward, where normally you want a little bit extra buffer there um, just because of Woodward itself for protection and yeah. for privacy. Um, normally I would be upset with the, the whole ask for forgiveness and say a, it's the contractor's negligence for not knowing it ahead of time. But in this case, um, <laughs> they're in luck. I, I, I agree with the, the, the need for that higher fence at this location for their practical difficulty. So because of that, I will also be voting in favor of this variance. All right, seeing if there's no other comments, we'll go ahead to the vote. Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Gavin. Yes. Mr. Reddy. Yes. Mr. Clatt. What was it? Yes. Okay, sorry, you, you sounded muted. Ms. Grant. Yes. Ms. Zukin. Yes. And Ms. Robinson. Yes. All right, congratulations. It passes, your fence is all good. Thank you. We will move on to the next one. Uh, let's see. Case number 21-11-49, Mr. Murphy, whenever you are ready. Yep, uh, one, one moment. Yep, no problem. This will be- Let people in and jot down some notes. You're doing great on time. Yeah. Can you hear us? Yes, we'll, we'll, we're gonna put you on mute for a moment. I'm gonna go through your report and then the board will have some questions for you. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and we can go through the petitioner's request. So the subject property is located on the east side of Ferris and that's near the intersection of 13 Mile Road and Campbell. As you can see is a one uh, a single family home, two story single family home with a 453 square foot detached garage to the rear. And the petitioner proposes to demolish the existing garage. We'll get a better view of that. Demolish the existing garage and construct a, a new larger garage that's 667 square feet in the same approximate location. The proposed garage measures to the midpoint of the roof line, measures uh, nearly 14 feet in height. And 14 feet in height is, is allowable so long as it's set back no less than four feet from the property line. And the petitioner pr uh, proposes to site it about 3.3 feet from the property line. So they're seeking the uh, variance from that slight difference of the minimum required setback for the garage. The 
floor plan for the garage uh, as a, under the zoning ordinance, uh, an accessory structure, or in this case, the detached garage, can be cannot exceed 10% of the lot area, and in no instance can it exceed 800 square feet in ground floor area. This lot is just under 6,000 square feet. It's 5,989 square feet in lot area. And the proposed 667 square foot detached garage results in an accessory lot coverage of 11.1%. So the petitioner, again, the maximum is 10%. So the petitioner is seeking a variance to waive 1.1% of that maximum allowable 10%. And that equates to 68 square feet. For a lot less than 6,000 square feet in area, there can be a total ground floor coverage of no more than 1,800 square feet. And that's for all structures combined. Again, the site is just under 6,000 square feet in area. So 1,800 square feet is that maximum. And the petitioner, uh, the proposed garage results in a sum total ground floor area for all the structures of 2,180 square feet. So the petitioner is seeking a variance to waive 308 square feet of that maximum allowable 1,800 square foot total lot coverage for all structures. We did receive six written public comments, which are attached to uh, the board's online report. We did not receive any audio comments uh, today. And with that, I can answer any questions the board may have. All right. Is there any questions for Mr. Murphy? Ms. Sukin. If it was a 6,000 square foot lot, how much would the total coverage limit be? Mm -hmm. To that calculation, I know the petitioner has. Mr. Clett, was that going to be your answer? Uh, 1600, uh, a 6,000 square foot lot at 30% is 1,800 square feet. Okay. For, for 30 for 30% 30 lot coverage. So the ordinance says that for a lot that's less than 6,000 square feet, it can have up to 35% lot coverage, but in no instance, more than 1,800 square feet. So the closer the lot gets to 6,000 square feet, the more it comes in line with that 1,800 square foot max. If it was a very small lot, 5,000 square feet, it would be a much, it would be a higher number. It would be a larger number. Mr. Clint. That answer my question. Thank you. Um, Mr. Murphy, I had a quick question. So the current garages, that's a little over 400 square feet, correct? And they just want it to be larger, correct? Yes, the current garage is 453 square feet and they're proposing a garage that's 667 square feet. Okay. So in other words, with the current garage, they're already over the maximum allowable. yes they are slightly yes they are by uh 94 square feet okay so that means they're just over that and they're just under the allowable lot coverage of 10 percent currently yes the currently they're at 7.6 percent lot coverage for the garage itself okay. All right. and in total lot coverage they're at 31.6 percent Okay. So currently, the total lot coverage is in excess of the of allowable. Okay. Now, it may very well have been built when there was a different uh, total lot coverage standard in place. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Murphy? All right. Seeing none, uh, the petitioner can introduce themselves with name and address and go ahead and state their uh, case. Um. Hopefully we don't run out of power here. We're trying to sign on through the computer that just decided to update. So, oh no! We'll make yeah, that I know. We're, we're logging back on. We're logging back on through the computer too. But uh, okay, so I'm Dan and Kay Hauser. Uh, we live at 3110 Ferris Avenue. Uh, let's see, we're 28 year residents of the 
city. We raised our three children here. Uh, back 18 years ago, and you can probably see in the aerial photo that the, we put an addition on for our growing family at that time. Uh, at that time, there was no variances that re were required, uh, just as a side note. So we, uh, as I'm getting closer to retirement, uh, hopefully within eight years or so, I quite frequently go up into the attic of the existing garage to get some storage stuff, Christmas trees, Christmas lights, uh, cores, camping gear. And my desire was to make the garage bigger. You get that stuff out of the attic of the garage and get it onto the first floor. I don't see myself being 70 years old crawling around in the attic of the garage. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's what was causing the size that we're requesting. Some of the height request is coming from, I'm trying to keep the pitch of the roof more in line with what the other dwellings are around here. Most of the roofs in this area are all 8, 12 pitches. And I wanted to keep, I didn't think we needed to go to 8, 12, but I wanted to keep it 6, 12. And that's what kind of causes the height to be what it is. So I wouldn't be changing the height at the eaves at all. It, it's just the pitch of the roof is what's causing the uh, almost 14 foot that Joseph was speaking of. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, I didn't want to move the garage any further away from the fence line uh, because the truck that I do keep in the garage, it's a historical truck. Uh, it's very, it's not, it's, I can get it in and out fairly easy right now, but if I move the whole garage another foot over, I, it's into my picnic table that I keep out in the driveway. So my whole goal here was not to be moving picnic tables and stuff around to be able to pull vehicles in and out of the garage. So that's, that's why I wanted to keep it where it was at. So I'm really essentially looking for the same structure I have another eight feet deeper. And you know, really the width, the reason it's a little bit wider is I wanted to put two by six walls in for better insulation instead of the existing two by four walls. All right, thank you. Is there any questions for the petitioner? Uh, none from me. I'm on this side of the board, from the board. Oh. <laughs> um, what uh, what practical difficulties do you have right now, other than storage and stuff, which isn't really a practical difficulty in, in a sense of hardships. It, it's more along the lines of, hey, I've just got things. We're talking about other type of practical difficulties. Well, I'm concerned if I'm going to retire here, I don't want to be crawling up and down the ladder to get into the upper portion of that garage. And that's where I have to go for a lot of my stuff right now. Okay. Uh, any other questions for the petitioner? All right, seeing none before we bring it to this side of the board, we are short a full board, We're down one person. You could wait till next month when we might have a full board, but then again, we might not have one next month. Would you like us to continue on and vote on your uh, variances, or would you like us to delay it till next month? For up no, I'm trying to get this in before the snow flies. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Then we'll pull it back to this side of the table. Is there any discussion and or motions? Ms. Robinson. You're muted. Sorry, I lost it. Um, as far as hardships, I'm just thinking about the fact that, I mean, these are long-term um, residents of Royal Oak and have raised the whole family here. The, these bungalows are very, they're small. How I grew up in one, they're small and there isn't a lot of storage. Um, I can see that, um, the, the size of the lots and the, the architecture of the homes, there's so many in Oil Oak, can kind of be a hardship that if we had a bigger lot, I suppose we would allow it to be bigger. Just a thought. 
Any other comments? Mr. Gavin, was that a hand? Yep. Uh, it was actually me leaning, but then it was turning oh. into a hand. <laughs> but oh, sorry. I, I think Mr. Moore was actually ahead of me on raising his yep, hand. Yep, go ahead, Mr. Moore. Uh, sure. I mean, as far as a, a, a practical difficulty, I mean, I see this as a, a safety thing. I mean, he's, he's mentioned that it's getting to the point where it doesn't seem like it would be safe at, at the age that he will be to, you know, go to the only spot that he has for storage. So I'm looking at it from a, a safety standpoint based on what he's mentioned here. Mr. Gavin, were you going to say something or no, just, no, okay. Yeah, I, I was going to say something. So just to kind of move things along, I'm, I'm still torn on the, the size, but I, I am comfortable with moving for uh, approval of item A, which is the, uh, the side yard setback issue because I, I you mean B, that. C, C is the side. Is that C? Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. They, they got all mixed up. Yeah. Uh, can yeah. can somebody tell? Is this like a regular, like long, unlimited baby? <laughs> Travis, can you tell? Sorry about that. Back again. Um. Yeah, this one looks better. This is not a forty-minute one. Okay. Sorry. Should be good now. But it's also not like a webinar type meeting, so there may not be a waiting room. So. Hopefully then people will just be courteous. Yeah. We're gonna let everybody in the meeting and we're just gonna keep those who don't have cases going on right now, we're just gonna keep them muted so they can see what's going on in case we get booted out once again, but hopefully that's not the case. Okay, right, let's see how, Robert, okay. Ms. Zukin, Mr. Klatt, Mr. Grant, Ms. Moore, Mr. Reddy. So we are just waiting for, Ms. Robinson to join us back again. See, I told you you needed to be faster. <laughs> I try. I, I, I kind of like this format. <laughs> we make decisions quickly, but not quick enough, obviously. So again, we're gonna let we're gonna let everybody in. I'm not gonna put people in the waiting room. I'm just gonna, if you're not your case, I'm going to mute you so that you so can- So if we're not gonna do a red light, green light thing. Yeah. Oh. Because we can do it ourselves. We'll wait just a moment and then we can recommence the meeting. Let me send out a text to Nancy and see if she got the. She should have. Right. As frustrating as it is, she should have gotten it. Again, we're gonna we're gonna let everybody in who who uh, to the meeting. We're gonna if it's not your case case currently, we're simply going to mute you. You but you will be able to see what's occurring, and cross your fingers. We'll hope to get to your case at some point in the near future. Joseph, I've made you the um, co the host rather, so I'm gonna mute myself now. But I'll be around in case you need me. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. All right. I'm just waiting for Ms. Robinson to join us again. I don't have a reply from her yet. Oh, she just replied. She said she didn't get the new link yet. I'll copy and paste it into her text.
just to announce one more time, we're going to let everybody in. No more waiting room. We're just going to let everybody in. If it's not your case, we're going to mute you so that you can still see what's occurring. And um, again, cross, cross uh, your fingers. We'll get to your case shortly. Okay. I have texted her the link, so hopefully she'll be on in a moment. And then we can restart this. Apologize again for all the technical difficulties. There we go. Nancy's phone. If you'd like to call the meeting back to order, that would be uh, that would be yep. appropriate. Yep. State the statement, do I or no? Uh, no, we're, we're simply calling the meeting back to order after having some we'll call right. technical technical difficulties. We, we yep. got canceled yep. and kicked out, so we're back. And there's Nancy. Okay, so we're going to call this uh, meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, back to order. We have all the, member, the board members who were there previously in line. And right before we had the drop off, I believe Mr. Gavin was about to propose uh, granting variance C as requested. So moved. Okay. Is there a second for, for that? Mr. Klett, seconds. Go ahead, Mr. Gavin. Uh, on this one, the, I see the, the, the practical difficulty. They, the, they're using the existing, you know, site of the garage, um, without moving it, you know, but otherwise the, uh, you know, that, that height of a garage would otherwise be allowed. Um, so because of the fact that they're, they're just using partial part of the existing, you know, uh, site for the garage, I, I have, I, I see the practical difficulty there and, you know, I, I do commend you for reaching out to all of your neighbors and getting so much support for, uh, for, uh, for your proposed garage here. Um, so for, for those reasons, uh, um, I, I'm fine, comfortable with the, the setback issue. Okay. Anything to add? Just for item C. Yeah, for item C, I see practical difficulty being the placement of the existing home. It'd be a challenge to get, if you're forced to ship it over, but I could see it being a challenge getting the vehicle or any vehicle into the garage. So I'm okay with item C. All right. Ms. Sukin? My only problem with item C is I don't think you need to go up to the 14 feet and therefore you could go four feet. Uh, you could to be three feet from the property line. And, and that's what I would prefer to see in this case. They Design-wise, they'd like to go up to 14, um, but the variance is in place for a reason. And I don't see a practical difficulty. I see a personal difficulty here. Um, the plight of the landowner is not, due, uh, the, is not due to the unique circumstances of the property, but to the landowner. And I certainly understand being 70 and not wanting to go up into your attic, but he's going to have even more of an attic now. And the hardship um, has, has been created by the person who has possession now. So I don't think we meet the requirements of the ordinance. Okay. Anyone else like to speak on that? All right, seeing none, we will go to, oh, Nancy, did you have a hand? No, okay. We'll move to a vote then. Uh, we'll go in the opposite order on the screen. Mr. Reddy. Yes. Ms. Zukin. No. Mr. Klatt. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Okay, Ms. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Moore. Yes. Uh, Mr. Gavin? Yes. And for this one, I will say yes also. So motion C passes, seven to one. And what about uh, B and A? Is there any discussion and or motions related to those? Anyone want to take a stab at it? Mr. Klatt? Actually more of a question for the applicant on this one. So for item A, you're asking for a 68 square foot overage. In most cases, in many cases in the past, I've, I've 
voted for larger garages when the lot can support it. But in this case, I don't think it can. If I look at this, based on the garage width, a reduction of three feet, generally 3.25 feet, would allow this to comply. What's the reason for that extra length? Did you know that when you designed this that you were over? Yes, I did. I was uh, targeting 20 by 30, and it was based off of, and it's in your packet of materials, and it's just some of the stuff that I put in it, uh, along with my historical truck, and I'm an avid woodworker, so I have a lot of woodworking equipment, and I've got smokers and uh, some big grills. You, you, that's kind of how I laid out the 20 by 30. I guess you're, what, I'm, what I'm asking is you, you cannot live with a 3.25 foot reduction in the overall length to make it comply. I don't even think it's a 3.25 foot reduction though, is it? Uh, 68 square 20, feet. Are you talking like, you're talking item A, right? 1.1 square feet over? Yeah, correct. 68, 68 square, square feet, feet on a 20 foot wide, I'd have to reduce it by one foot, right? Oh, I'm no, talking great. length. I'm talking length. Either way, either way, it's a 68 square foot reduction. I see hard pressed to reduce the width to get a vehicle in it. The length you could do though. I'm not trying to design it on the fly. I'm just asking the question. Well, yeah, I guess you could. But that's not what my preference was when we went into this. Mm. Uh, one of the other board members made a comment, something about the lack of storage space in these bungalows, and she's right. All right. Uh, bringing it back to this side of the board, is there any other discussion and or motions? Mr. Gavin. I guess, you know, kind of in that vein, because I, I, I was kind of wondering the same thing that Mr. Klatt just asked, you know, in my mind, you know, if, if there's a way we could reduce the number of variances here, I'd, I'd be a little bit more inclined to support this. Um, as it stands right now, it just seems like a little too much of an ask for me. Um, the, you know, if, if we could, you know, come down at three and a quarter feet, you know, so we wouldn't, we wouldn't approve a, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit more inclined to, to be okay with the total lot coverage in B because it's already over, you know, it's already you know, it, 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 you know, with the existing garage you have, you're already over. So it's just, you know, I, as it stands, I don't think I could support A, A or A and B together, but I, I might be okay with B. So if I were to paraphrase, you might be interested in saying denying A, but granting B with a 68 foot reduction. So therefore waive 240 feet of the maximum allowable. Is that what you're saying, Mr. Gavin? Yeah, along those lines, yeah. It, okay. I know it would require. Well, do you want to propose that there. then? Uh, I mean, I could propose that or like, like again, Mr. Klatt said, you know, he's not, we're not here to, to redesign and I don't want anybody to redesign on the fly, but I also understand the need to get this done before winter if you can. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I kind of would leave it up to the petitioner if they, you know, that, that's that's generally my preference, you know, if they want to come back and after taking a look at it again, or if they, uh, um, or if they just want to kind of, we can come up with those calculations. I mean, this one's a relatively straightforward compared to some of the other variance requests that we see. So I'm, I could go either way, but that's kind of where I'm at. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Anyone else have comments or do you want me to ask the petitioner? Right, no other questions, comments. Uh, so then the petitioner would, oh, Mr. Moore. Yeah, I think we should um, maybe, I, and I think you're about to do this, just ask them if they want to yep, come back. We've given yeah. people that opportunity before. Well, okay. Uh, so the petitioners, would you like to, as you can hear from the board, they're, they're all right, we're granting you some, it sounds like they might be all right with, granting some of the B, but not really of A. So are you all right with withdrawing A and allowing them to reduce what you're asking for in B? Or would you rather delay this, look at it, come back next month? No, no. so uh, okay. 
to take and reduce it back to 68 square feet to make a compilable, I can do that. Okay. We'll make it work. Okay, so the petitioner is withdrawing A, and that'll leave us with theoretically 240 feet for the maximum allowable lot coverage. Um, would anyone like to make a motion now? Mr. Gavin. So moved. All right, is there a second? Mr. Klatt, seconds? Well, let's make sure we understand what the variance request is for. So okay. it, it's it's been modified to waive 240 square feet of the maximum allowable total lot coverage of 1,800 square feet. Is that correct? Correct. And I'm sorry, the, the motion was made by Mr. Gavin and seconded by? Mr. Klatt. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Gavin? Um. I don't really have much to add on what we've went on top of what we've already discussed. Um, so. Okay, Mr. Clint, anything to add? Same here. I think we made a good attempt to reduce one variance request, and we still have a, we still get a bit of overage from what they're what's allowable, and uh, we waived one request. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay, um, Mr. Reddy. I just, oh yeah, sorry. I just wanted to point out that um, reducing the 68 feet does bring it under 35% lot coverage. Not that that's the standard, but it does bring it under 35. Reducing it by one foot brings it under 35%. Okay. Any other comments? All right. I too will. Oh, Nancy, were you going to say something? No. Okay, I too will, uh, after removing A, I will uh, be in favor of this variance request. This was stated, the current garage will be over the 1,800 square feet uh, for total lot coverage. And I have a hard press wanting to do more, but then 1.1% removing that, uh, um, I'm all right, even though the practical difficulty, I all agree with Mizukin, is more of personal, rather hardship that created by themselves. But in this case, I, I, I think this is a good balance. So in that moment, I will uh, agree with the variance. So with that, we'll start off with uh, voting. Mr. Gavin. Yes. Mr. Moore. Yes. Ms. Robinson. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Klett. Yes. Ms. Zukin. Yes. Mr. Reddy. Yes. And I will vote yes. So that's unanimous. So luck with your garage. All right, uh, we'll move on to the next case. Whenever Mr. Murphy is ready, it'll be case number 21-11-50 for 202 Crane Avenue. Whenever you are ready, Mr. Murphy. Okay, thanks for waiting. This site is located on the north side of Crane, which is near the intersection of North Main Street and Catalpa. It's improved with a two-story single-family home and a 570-square-foot detached garage, uh, which is to the rear. On the screen, you'll see the existing condition on the, on the left side of the screen and the proposal on the right side. The petitioner is proposing to remove the existing detached garage, which is in the center of the rear yard, and construct a uh, rear yard addition to the house itself, which includes a 1,242 square foot attached garage with living space uh, above it. The zoning ordinance, as uh, board members know, it allows for accessory structures to have no greater than 800 square feet of floor area. And the petitioner, again, is proposing a, an attached garage that's 1,242 square feet. So they're seeking a waiver of 442 square feet from that maximum allowable. Ordinance does allow for a single family home to have no greater than 3,500 square feet of residential floor area. The existing dwelling contains 2,600 and 
45 square feet of usable floor area. And the petitioner proposed the, the ground floor addition of living space and the second story addition of living space. That adds an additional 1,811 square feet of floor area to the structure. So the resulting single family home square footage would be 4,456 square feet. The petitioner would be is seeking a variance of 956 square feet from that maximum. And the site, as you can uh, see from the from the design, currently has two paved driveways on each side of the house. The, drive, the paved driveways extend towards the uh, towards the house, and then beyond, there is a uh, dirt or unimproved U shape in the backyard that leads to the detached garage that will be removed. The petitioner proposes to retain the existing, uh, both existing driveways and drive approaches and extend the driveway on the east side of the house, extend that driveway to the new attached garage, which is to the, to the rear of the dwelling. Once a driveway is modified, it needs to comply with current ordinance requirements and the city zoning ordinance allows for one driveway per single family home site. There are some exceptions, uh, some for a horseshoe shaped driveway, which would be exclusively within the front yard or a T appendage, which would be in the front exclusively in the front yard as well. Uh, so that this design uh, isn't much different from what's there, uh, but it but the petitioner is seeking the opportunity to um, to retain the westernmost driveway, and I'll hover over that. So the one that's not on the garage side of the house, uh, they're seeking a variance in order to retain that. And we did receive one written public comment with regard to this case, which is included in in your packet. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Is there any questions for Mr. Klatt? Uh, Mr. Murphy, the applicant's plan suggests an overall lot coverage of, I think, 23.5%. Is that what your department calculated as well? I can look that up really quick. Thank you. It's going to be my question was, what is the current lot size? Uh, yes, and a lot. This is a very large uh, lot for, for the neighborhood and for being in a standard in the one family residential zoning district. This lot's uh, 13,240 square feet. So that again, it's it's I'm going to say on average probably double what the, a normal lot, a standard lot is in a single family neighborhood, and the total lot coverage, existing uh, yes, uh, sixteen point eight, and the resulting lot coverage of all the structures on the site, the resulting lot coverage would be twenty three and a half percent, so well below that thirty percent total allowable. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Murphy? All right, seeing none, we'll have the petitioner come forward, state their name and address for the record. Well, I first, I'm Mike Gordon from Moise Gordon Associates Architects. I'm here today representing the homeowners who are also with us tonight, Katie and Trevor Mantis. Tonight, um, as Mr. Murphy explained, we're reviewing in addition to existing two-story Dutch colonial style home. The addition and site design as noted will require three variances, size of the allowable accessory structure, size of the home and the second driveway to remain. The driving motivation for the client for this expansion had several factors. As the family grows, more garage space is needed for multiple vehicles, including company vehicles that they drive. And Trevor is in the auto business. And as many people in this community do have multiple vehicles of their own. Further, the existing home is currently three bedrooms and additional bedrooms were desired for the growing family. Additional family space and home workspace for the kids was another component. And as the pandemic has changed the nature of work, the addition frees up more space for home offices and for working from home. This 80 foot lot by 168 feet deep is large and can accommodate a generous amount of square footage. If you look at the given setbacks, and the lack coverage of 30%, a footprint of 4,000 square feet would be attainable. As noted, the lack coverage as proposed is growing from 16.8 to 23.5. Oh, still well below the 30%. The governing code for the size of accessory structures has two components. One, not to exceed 10% of the lot size. 
The second component, not to exceed 800 square feet. As noted in the staff report, if you look at the 10% only factor, the proposed garage is only 9.4% lot coverage. It should be noted the present unique circular driveway as was discussed and the detached garage arrangement, arrangement gives an impervious surface of 44.6%. The new configuration will actually reduce that by a few hundred square feet or about one and a half percent. So there'll be less impervious surface. Further, the double driveway already exists. So it won't really change the relationship to the neighborhood. If this lot had been developed as two homes, there would be two driveways. Also, the need for off-street parking on this block is great, given that there is no parking allowed on the north side of the street and only two-hour parking on the south side of the street. So off-site parking is very desirable here. The exterior design is styled to match and blend with the existing architecture and is set back from the front to maintain the existing street presence. We think this is a reasonable solution that solves the client's needs, addresses any concerns that the community might have, and will be an asset to the community. We hope you look favorably upon this, and the homeowners and I are ready to answer any questions you have. Thank you. All right. Is there any questions for the petitioners? All right. I, I have one at least. Um, and I... I agree, we don't like to design on the fly, but did you look at having the entrance, using the left driveway entrance as the main entrance and coming into the garage in the backyard and not needing that second entrance on the right side so that this way we don't have to have two entrances as you currently have? Well, the, the, the driveway is truncated, you know, so it only it's only in the front yard, the rest of it is removed. And the logic of putting the, garage to the right is it's attaching to the mudroom to the kitchen. So the flow, if you look at the way the plan is laid out, and like I said, it's there. And because of the limited on-site or on-street on parking, um, you know, it, it, it exists and would just be another expense to remove it. And again, it's um, the, the, we look at multiple different options, including just taking the existing garage and expanding it but it's positioning in the middle of the backyard for that garage chews up a lot of the backyard space. This is actually allowing for uh, more backyard. Um, and the only reason to maintain that second driveway is because again, there's, there, there's no parking on the street. And, uh, or like I said, there's limited parking on the south side of the street. And when you entertain, you're, you know, and they have a large family that, you know, having a couple extra spaces for cars to park on the site and, once again, it doesn't visually change anything that the neighbors haven't been living with for, you know, since the house has been there. Okay. Mr. Platt. Girl, in fact, were you suggesting more of a side entry garage approach? Correct. Is that what you were referring to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, same but question that, I had. Yeah, but a side entry garage would push it back into the middle of the backyard, chewing up most of the backyard space. Either, either side you would enter from, the garage would have to be approximately 30 feet from the property line, which would, again, position in the middle of the backyard, shooting up the yard. This actually preserves and just presents a two-car style garage door with the storage space inside. So I think, you know, looking at that and trying to, you know, see where the existing garage is, you know, if we put a three-car garage, in order to make it a side entrance, you would have to pave all the way around the back and to the side expand that to a uh, it's it's all right that's not what i was getting at i was working okay. the current design saying if it could have came from the left in other words no you did you, you're wanting to do this that's fine i oh, know but you, again if it was coming from the left you'd be paving most of the backyard i i, I understand yeah. any other questions for the petitioner All right, seeing none, um, as stated before, there's not a full board. We're down one member. We may get a full board next month. We may not. Would you like us to proceed with uh, discussion and motions, or would you like us to delay till next month and possibility of a full board? I believe the homeowner would like to proceed. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, then we will proceed. We will pull to the side of the table, per se. Any discussion and or motions? Anyone you want to take that first crack? Mr. Clatt. 
For the sake of discussion, I'll make a motion to approve the variances as suggested. All right. Is there a second? Mr. Gatt, seconds. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Clare. Was initially against item number C, which is the driveway, but the applicant did a good job explaining the need for that. I, I understand that now based on the parking along the street. So I can see that. I, I, initially, I, would, I don't think it'd be a good idea to have two driveways, but that makes some sense. I do question the placement of the garage doors. I thought that could be a solution to have a side entry, but I also see the applicant's point there for chewing, essentially chewing up of the lawn area in the backyard. And again, this is a large lot, like the past case where we didn't have a large lot like this, this can support it. We're less than 10% for the accessory structure and less than 30% for overall lot coverage. It's for the most part concealed in the rear yard and it looks like we do have some neighbor support for it. So for those reasons, mm -hmm. I will be in support. Okay, Mr. Gavin, anything to add? No, nothing to add. I, I do agree though, I was a little torn on this one, but the, the size of the lot and you know our it kind of kicks it up that level to me. And I, I just, the, with the driveways, um, I understand about the backyard and the side, side entry uh, piece, but the other piece of it is it's already there and it's, uh, um, you know, it's not, it's not changing anything. They're not adding anything. They're just, you know, re, re, uh, rearranging what they do have. So for that reason, I'm okay with it. Okay. Any other comments? Ms. Zukin. I do not see any practical difficulties here. Um, it's not a large lot neighborhood. It's it's nice that it's a larger lot, but there's no reason to go over 3,500 square feet. I think it's already too large for the neighborhood. It stands yeah. out. Um, as far as the two driveways, I didn't have a problem at first, but saying that there's only parking on one side of the street doesn't sway me at all because there's many streets in Royal Oak that have parking on one side and they don't have two driveways and they don't have a big lot and they're not proposing a big garage. Um, so I just frankly don't think that any aspect of section two under the ordinance for non-use variances is met. So I won't be voting to approve this. Okay. Any other comments? Anyone? Yep, no, Nancy or Miss Robinson, yep. You're muted. And I for, forgive me because since we redid this, I'm having to limp along here on my phone That's and okay. I can't, it's real hard. Um, just about the parking business there. One thing I do wanna say where that street is, if you're ever near that street at three o'clock, it's crazy because of the school right there. I mean, and that, that parking is a huge problem that is different than any other, you know, a normal street in Royal Oak. That it's so close to the school, it's filled with moms picking up kids. So I understand the two, I, I get it, the two, the two driveways. That's all. And I'll be in favor of this. Okay. Any other comments? Mm -hmm. okay. All right. I'll say that I'm sort of torn on this. Uh, although with the square the square feet for the accessory structure, because it's a larger lot, I, I'm more amenable to allowing that. And if you're doing that square footage for that structure um, and you're not adding on much onto the rest of the house, you're just adding on top of that structure, that's how you get bumped over into how high they are. So because you're not adding any more square foot footprint onto the lot, other than that little connection, that breezeway connection or the mudroom connection, I, I'm all right with A and B. I'm really torn on C, but with Nancy's description or Miss Robinson's description of the parking there, which I'm not as familiar with, because um, when I w drove by it, it wasn't during that time. Um, I can see how that's a practical difficulty in that case, just like uh, they're talking about for certain times. So that that I can understand. So I'll be in favor of this uh, motion. Mm -hmm. And with that, we will go to vote unless there's any last second motion, uh, comments? Nothing? Okay, Mr. Gavin. Aye. Ms. Zugan. No. Mr. Reddy. Aye. Mr. Moore. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Clatt. Yes. Ms. Robinson. Yes. And I will vote yes. So that's seven to one. Passes, so 
congratulations you. for your uh, new addition. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll Thank you for your patience to tonight. Yep. We will move on to the final one whenever you are, Mr. Ready, okay. Or, okay. Mr. Murphy, when you're ready. Case number 21-11-51 for 32301 Woodward Avenue. Yes, I'm going to share my screen. All right, so the subject property is located on the west side of Woodward between Normandy and 14 Mile Road. It's a two-story building that was most recently utilized for uh, the sale of home furnishings. Uh, it's known as the Art Band Building. Um, I think everyone is probably very familiar with it. And the petitioner proposes to renovate the building by eliminating the ground level retail floor area. So the north side of the ground floor currently has a floor area dedicated to the previous uh, retail sales. And the petitioner is proposing to uh, remove that and, and go back to the original design, which had ground floor parking all, uh, okay. the entire length of the building. And the and they would renovate the second floor per, for professional office space. The proposed renovations result in a second floor usable floor area of 43,490 square feet. The st staff, uh, when staff reviewed the floor plan, and I'm gonna zoom in on part of it to give you a clear understanding of their layout and proposed use. So I'll show the south side of the building. Uh, the staff had, uh, in its calculation, deducted janitors, closets, uh, stairwells, elevators, restrooms to the tune of 4,650 square feet. And again, that gets to the resulting 43,439 square feet of usable floor area. And we require one parking space for 225 square feet of usable floor area for professional office space. Therefore, the proposal requires 193 off-street parking spaces. The modifications to the building result in 132 off-street parking spaces at the ground level. And the petitioner, logically, is seeking a variance to waive 61 of the minimum required 93 off-street parking spaces. We did not receive any audio public comment tonight we there's some written correspondence from the legal representatives of the petitioner and the property owner to the north and those have been tacked on to the end of the the uh, report and the petitioner um, the petitioner can describe to you their business operation and why they believe they uh, there's a hardship in the ordinance requirements to their business practices and to their floor plan I'll point out on the floor plan some some different elements uh, from a professional, standard professional office. You'll see in the hatched and uh, bluish gray shaded area, they have enclosed courtyards. We did count those because those are enclosed. They have a glass, a glass ceiling or a glass roof. Uh, so they are enclosed conditioned spaces. They're usable, but obviously that's different from a standard operation. And you'll see what they have labeled as in the center of the building, the war room, which is a conference room. And uh, to the south side of the building, they have an additional enclosed courtyard and a large training auditorium and a workout room. All of those spaces were counted towards usable floor area. Uh, while they may not be utilized entirely every day on an ongoing basis, they're certainly usable floor area that can be utilized. And there would be nothing that would prohibit them from converting those areas to um, what we'll refer to as standard cubicle floor area, a uh, cubicle spaces uh, for floor area for office, traditional office. But again, the petitioner can describe to you why, believe, why they believe uh, that they do not require as much parking per the ordinance. Okay. Mr. Clatt. That's really my question. This plan shows numerous uh, common or shared spaces. So I think the applicant could expand upon that. But also I believe the applicant mentioned 76 shared spaces on site. Do we, I assume that is with the, uh, the, the neighboring funeral home. Do we know where those 76 spaces are? Yeah, the petitioner can speak a little further to that, but that's where some of the recent correspondence um, is, is helpful for the board. 
in that there was, uh, they can describe it further, but there was an original agreement with the prior uh, ownership that uh, they felt was transferable and the property owner to the north is claiming that they're exhibiting their right to cancel or terminate that agreement, which would prohibit uh, the petitioner from gaining access to any of the sur surface parking that uh, is associated with the funeral home. So in order for, uh, there is an ordinance provision which allows for a site, an adjacent site that has an excess of parking per the ordinance to have a shared parking agreement with an adjacent site that doesn't have enough parking. Uh, and so we're able to, if both parties agree to it and they provide the documentation and we can demonstrate that the one is short and the one has a surplus and they meet the standards of that shared agreement, that is something, uh, that is a provision in the ordinance which could allow them to not have to seek a variance. But that is not the instance in this case, even if both parties agreed to terms and conditions to share parking that's available at the funeral parlor property. Again, they, they don't meet that provision at, at all. They can have uh, side agreements with as many property owners do, um, side agreements with adjacent property owners or nearby property owners that the staff doesn't recognize uh, in terms of complying to meet the minimum required parking for their own site. But it's oftentimes a business practice that um, occurs. There's just no enforceability whatsoever from the city standpoint in order to, um, if that agree agreement dissolves um, uh, for us to go in and we'll say close down a business because now they're not in compliance with a minimum required parking. It's an absolute nightmare to try and track and to enforce. And once a business is up and running, you'd be hard, for, hard pressed to find a judge that didn't claim they had a vested right to continue to operate. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Murphy? Seeing none, uh, I see there's a lot of people in line for the petitioner. Uh, hopefully there's just one or two of you that are willing to speak. And if so, uh, to present the case, please uh, introduce yourself and your address for the record. I'd be glad to. My name is Pat Lennon. I'm an attorney with the Honigman firm. We're based in Bloomfield Hills. Uh, with me tonight is Joe Agri. He's president and chief executive officer of the Agri company. Uh, Danielle Spear is also with us. She's general counsel of Agri. Kevin Bittison of Bittison Architects is also with us. And so is my partner, Lowell Salison from Honigman. So uh, we, we feel we probably have enough representation here to <laughs> give you everything you need. And, and let me begin by saying, um, we agree with Mr. Murphy with respect to the parking agreement. Um, we submitted a supplemental information today uh, clarifying, I think, our arrangement with the neighbor to the north and pointing out that the parking agreement, it, while it exists, it really isn't relevant for the determinations tonight. We aren't counting those 76 spaces as part of our variance application. Um, you know, we're, we're applying for 61 um, in terms of a variance. And so while the parking agreement exists and it may uh, evolve, it really isn't relevant to the conversation tonight because we aren't trying to include those spaces in our discussion and, and they're not included in our analysis. So uh, sorry about the distraction that might have presented, but it's, it's, it's really not material to, you know, why we really think that, that we should um, have our application looked upon favorably. Um, you know, as you know, um, uh, we're asking for your approval for a parking space variance tonight, which if granted, would enable the Agri company to transform what is now a vacant property located at 32301 Woodward into a state-of-the-art corporate headquarters building. Uh, we're delighted to share that if the ZBA approves our application, Agri not only plans to proceed with its purchase of the property, but also to invest approximately $10 million to transform it into a beautiful new building. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Agri, you should know it's one of Michigan's great companies, and Joe Agri is one of Michigan's great business leaders. The company was found and founded in 1971. It's been a public company since 1994. 
It's traded on the New York Stock Exchange. They have approximately 1,340 properties located throughout 47 states across the country. They've got 27 million square feet of uh, space. Um, they're a national recognize, nationally recognized leader in real estate development. And as you can see, I think from the innovative floor plans that have been presented and the other information that's been provided to you, um, the building that Agri is proposing will be tailored to its very specific proposed uses, its employee work habits, and, and really to the modern work environment. And, and as you look at this new building, you know, I, I would highlight some of the things that you just saw. Look at all that open space. You have three new indoor outdoor courtyards. You have a large boardroom. You have a training room. You have fitness facilities. You have locker rooms. You have a cafe area, breakout and meeting areas, collaboration areas, and lounges. What you're not hearing me saying is that we're trying to jam this thing full of offices and cubes. What, what's, what's interesting about this floor plan and, and really about the evolution of office space throughout America is that it's becoming different and it's becoming more amenitized and more collaborative. And ordinances that are tied to parking calculations that are based on square footage aren't necessarily the perfect measure for the actual parking needs of a facility. And so what you're gonna hear is that this project will renew and transform what is now a vacant and functionally obsolete building. As you pointed out, the building is a former Love's Furniture store and before that it was an art van. Um, unfortunately, there's an evolution going on in our architecture and in our building design. And due to changes in market conditions, many of which were accelerated by the pandemic, so-called big box furniture stores and retail stores have become obsolete. Traditional users of, of these kinds of spaces like Kmart, Toys R Us, Art Van, Loves, Sears, you know, they're gone or, or, or kind of on their way out. And they're simply unable to compete with the new online competition that they have to deal with and the delivery service oriented businesses that are just defeating the brick and mortar retail um, properties. So as a result, owners like Love's Furniture have had to close their doors. They've had to shut down and they've had to go bankrupt. That's a tragedy. And it's not just a tragedy for them, it's a tragedy for the communities where they leave these buildings. Because what happens is that you get a dark shuttered building with very few prospects to come take it over. And these buildings eventually become targets for blight, vagrants, trash dumping, you know, the things that just happen to buildings that aren't occupied aren't occupied. And I know, cause in my world, I see this all the time. I, I, I'm a zoning and land use lawyer. So I spend a lot of time throughout the state looking at these types of buildings and trying to transition them into something productive because they never quite fit the ordinances perfectly. And if you're a community like Royal Oak happens to be, that's fortunate enough to have a replacement user for a facility like this, that's willing to do the things that Agri is willing to do well, that's a real blessing because most of the, of the situations that I encounter, you know, I'm making these arguments to, to other municipalities and what we're trying to do is put a self-storage facility in there or put a marijuana provisioning center in there or put a distribution and delivery center in there or what we just a health and fitness centers. The, the, these types of properties are really distressed at this point. And it's very uncommon in this day and age, in the midst of this market climate, to have an opportunity to transform one of these into something that's actually gonna be better than what it was. So we hope you'll consider that as we're, as we're talking tonight, because in order to, to realize this opportunity, to, to seize this moment and prevent what would be, you know, likely a, a long period of decay, and if everyone thinks it's going to turn into, you know, another big box user, I would tell you, I just think that's, that's, that's wishful thinking. But anyway, it, but, but for us to do it, we need to have a variance from the parking requirement. And what, what's ironic about this, and I deal with this all the time, and I know you hear it all the time, we don't even need the spaces. So let, let, me, let me kind of walk through quickly the ordinance and, 
be respectful of everyone's time because I know this has gone uh, a while tonight due to some of the technical challenges. But the ordinance does require a building this size to have a total of 193 parking spaces. But I would, I would remind you that what you saw in that floor plan showed numerous open space areas that simply don't count in your ordinance when you're looking at usable square footage. In other words, we would, we, we would normally exclude those areas because they, they aren't going to be necessarily occupied as offices um, uh, and, and using parking spaces. So if we were to, to exclude some of the areas that, that we would have liked to have excluded, the number would have came, come way down. In any event, the total number of um, parking spaces now that we inherited is 79. But you may have heard, Hagri has agreed to convert the whole first floor to parking. What that's going to result in is an additional 53 spaces. That gets us up to 132 total parking spaces. When we, and that evolves that whole first floor. And that's a great um, drawing of it right there. So if you're following the map, this means that even after converting the whole first floor and putting in all the extra parking that we can possibly squeeze into this site, Agri still needs another 61 spaces to comply with the ordinance. And, and, and that's why we're here tonight because we're, we're trying to find a way to make this happen. And, and we think that it, it justifies a variance because frankly, Agri doesn't need any of the 61 extra spaces. Um, in fact, Agri doesn't even need all of the additional 53 spaces. Uh, you've heard you know, about the parking agreement. We don't need those spaces either. Um, like, like many companies in this day and age, Agri is adapting its office environment. We think this floor plan reflects that. And it's, it's undertaken this transformation through five, what I would call significant actions. First, it's reduced the number of on-site team members. When this facility opens, Agri contemplates having 70 team members on site regularly. When you look at all the workstations, there's only 112. So that, that, that's you know, basically what you're looking at. The 132 existing spaces are, are more than enough for that situation. So that's number one. We've reduced our number of on site team members. Second, Agri promotes remote working. This enables uh, Agri team members to work from home. Some of them don't come in on a daily basis. Some of them travel and work from the road. Third, they've incorporated a flexible work schedule with their employee teams. Some of them might come in for half a day. So some might come in for the second half. Those parking spaces, if needed, can be shared. These kinds of um, workplace uh, habits weren't necessarily the norm uh, not that long ago when these ordinances assumed that you would be in your office from nine to five and your car would be in your parking space during that same period. As you saw, number four, we have a modern open space plan. The plan is designed to promote collaboration and meetings. It, it's not designed to maximize density and squeeze in every worker we can squeeze in. It's intended to be open and, and, and receptive and, and welcoming. And I think that, that really shows in the plan. You look at all that space that isn't planned for offices. And then fifth and finally, there are emerging transportation alternatives that are actually to, to some people preferable to cars. You know, a lot of Agri's employees are interested in biking to work, walking to work, taking pedestrian means to, to get there. Others, and this is probably more prevalent down down Detroit because we see it a lot there, don't even own cars. They use Uber and Lyft when they need to drive somewhere. Otherwise, they're on foot or on bikes or on um, uh, other you know, means of transportation. Uh, and then finally, there's, there's carpooling and those types of things, which, which Agri encourages. So the confluence of these factors uh, result in a building that only needs a fraction of the spaces that would otherwise be required by the ordinance. As a result, in our view, the ordinance calculation produces an excessive and unnecessarily high requirement for, for the parking spaces. So we hope you'll consider that. And as you consider your analysis with, with respect to Agri's park, parking needs, I, I hope you'll also take this into consideration. 
nobody wants this to be right and wants this to work better than Agri. They, they hold themselves out as one of the best developers in the nation. The worst and most embarrassing thing that could happen to them is if they build a, a headquarters building that has a parking issue. A major priority of, of this whole approach, of this cultural move for this organization is to promote convenience and simplicity with respect to office use and office trips. A lack of parking and even inconvenient parking would damage all of that. It would also create issues with their employees, create issues with their neighbors, and create issues with the city. If you're a nationally known developer who's recognized for great work, who understands parking as well as anybody in the country, it would be an embarrassment. So they are not gonna put themselves in that position. They know what their parking needs are and they would not be pursuing a property that couldn't fully serve those. So I've spent a little bit of time talking about what I think the opportunity is, what I think the, the, the challenge is if the opportunity isn't seized and, and, and why we think the parking ordinance doesn't really address this property in the most effective way. But I think what's probably most important is that we, we meet, we contend we meet all the requirements in your ordinance. And, and I'll just run through those real quick and then we can go through any questions you have and our team's glad to respond to any of your thoughts. But first, consider this. If denied, would Agri be unreasonably prevented from using the property for a permitted purpose? Yeah, they would. Because an office is a permitted purpose. And in this day and age, with the way market conditions have changed, an office, particularly one such as this, is probably the highest and best use for that property. I think people that think that that could be retail again, you know, have illusions. And if they think that it's, it, it would be, it would be something far different than the structure that's there today. Uh, second, granting the variance would do substantial justice to the applicant as well as the other property owners in the area. Well, yeah, we, we think it does. And, and, uh, and, and I think this is gonna be great for the neighbors. The neighbors would, I, I believe, rather have a use that is going to be an office that is quieter, that is not as intensely used as a retail type use. In addition, we've, we're adding as many spaces as we can. We're adding those 53 spaces. And finally, think about this, because if you're someone in the community, you're used to this structure being there. We're not changing the footprint. It, it, it's still there and it's, and it's something that um, uh, is not going to become a disruption or something new. I suppose finally, office is always considered a good buffer between uses. You don't typically wanna go from a quiet residential community to a really active and intense retail use. So for all those reasons, we think we satisfy um, that requirement. The third one, the plight of Agri is due to unique circumstances of the property. Well, that one's, I would say, the most clear. The property is long and narrow. It's dominated by a, a building that will be very hard to remove or renovate. And the, the, the parking spaces that we can add, uh, we've, been, we've been adding. So Agri, in many ways, is the ideal user for this property because it doesn't have the same parking needs as an other uh, user would. And then finally, the hardship has not been created um, by the person having the interest in the property. Well, that's clearly true because if we could add more parking, if there was more land, I think they would try to just to get closer to the number that the city wants or that's required by the ordinance, I should say, even though they don't need all those spaces. Um, again, ironically, it's very fortunate that a potential user like Agri is, is interested in this property because if it isn't them, it's hard to imagine who it could be. So I hope you'll consider all of those thoughts and comments and view our application favorably. Mr. Agri's here, I'm here, my partner Lowell's here, the architect's here. It's very important to the company and uh, we look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Is there any questions for the petitioner? Ms. Sukin. 
You're muted. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know it's somewhere in the packet, but I'm having technical difficulties on this end. So can you tell me how many employees you expect to be on site at any given time? You know, at the maximum time. Yeah. I, what I know is we have 112. Well, Pat, Pat, let me, we do have, we have representatives from the company. Um, I think we anticipate about 70 employees. Um, that's sort of how the current floor plan lays out. And that's what we have today. I can let Joey, because um, I think it'd be great for all of you to have a chance to hear from Joey. Joey, will you answer um, Ms. Zukin's question? Sure. Good, good evening, everybody. Good evening, Ms. Zukin. So we have currently about uh, six, just over 60 team members uh, in our Bloomfield Hills campus, which is two buildings, which I'm sitting in now across from City Hall today. Uh, we anticipate by the time we move in um, and renovate the building, having approximately 70 to 75 as Pat mentioned, you know, this will enable us, th this existing footprint will enable us in floor plan that Kevin Bittison has designed, will enable us to expand to approximately 110 to 115 people. Um, and the 130 parking spaces, once we're moving the former Scott Shep Trine space originally and restoring it to its original condition, will provide more than enough ample parking for us. So as I sit here today in uh, an award-winning building, the building of the year, uh, that Kevin designed and the building adjacent to us, which we also own um, in our headquarters. You know, it's sad to leave here in Bloomfield Hills. Um, it's a beautiful space. Unfortunately, we outgrew it. We anticipate, you can see it behind me, doing something very similar. I think this will be a gateway and premier office building in the city of Royal Oak and a home for Eager Realty for a long time. And so we're very excited to take what, what is truly a functionally obsolete structure with, with less than 80 parking spaces right now and 70,000 square, over 70,000 square feet of retail space, just under 1,000. Um, it real, only real use today for retail is, is a furniture retailer. I mean, we've seen how Art Van and subsequently Loves has, has, has uh, ceased to exist. Thank you. Uh, yep, Ms. Sukin. Just a, a quick follow up. And do you have visitors to your site or is this all done yeah. remotely or? Very, very, very rarely. So obviously we're based here in Bloomfield Hills currently, um, but very rarely do we have many visitors. So we're not doing retail brokerage. We're an owner, a developer, acquirer of retail properties nationwide. And so very rarely, typically out of town guests, if they're either bankers, council, uh, investment bankers or investors will come to visit us in Bloomfield Hills. But uh, we don't get, very, very frankly, we don't get many visitors. So we're not doing business. We don't do any third party services, such as brokerage or construction. Um, and so it, uh, it's very rare that we get visited, especially rare now in the pandemic. <laughs> Mr. Reddy, I saw your hand and then Mr. Gavin. Um, I, I had a question. I don't know who specifically to address this to, but um, I don't know if this was in the packet. I saw that uh, the total common area was listed as 17,500 and. 63 square feet and so i just calculated by dividing 225 that um 78 spots were being accounted for the common area uh did anyone on your side do a similar calculation or is that in the packet anywhere well i think you're what i think you're referring to is the common area including the auditorium and the gymnasium yep. and the locker room very similar to what we have in our office today unfortunately the the, the the ordinance for the city of royal Oak does not exclude those areas and only excludes things such as the janitor's closet that mr murphy explained the stairwells and the elevators so it's a strict interpretation wow. of that continuous use provision um but like we have here in our in our buildings in bloomfield hills we have a an auditorium a wellness center i.e a gym locker rooms and so this is a very similar configuration albeit larger and under one roof and under one floor um i think uh, mr murphy is bringing it up right now but those are included uh unfortunately that square footage by the strict read of the ordinance is included for the one for 250 for office use okay. mr gavin you had a question yeah um uh, this i guess is mr for mr agree um uh Mr. Lennon talked about, you know, possibility of, you know, people having mixed schedules or sort of like a hybrid schedule or things like that. Yep. Um, I know my office, we've, we've got a policy in place for, you know, if, if employees want to right now, they can work from home. I'm much more flexible in how I run our office now. So yep. I was just wondering what your current policy is and what you intend to do in the future, if you know. 
uh, with regards to, you know, hybrid or work from yeah. home or that sort of thing? Yeah, our current policy really di di differentiates by team here. So if it's lease administration or asset management, they have a, a unique policy of a hybrid policy. We've given managers essentially throughout the organization the ability to set those schedules with their team members. Given the pandemic and the post-pandemic experiences of everybody in the workplace, we continue to have a significant amount of flexibility. That said, we only have 62 total team members today, and I would anticipate moving in with approximately 70 um, in the beginning of 2023. So there's obviously plenty of space in here, plenty of room for us to continue to grow. Uh, and plenty of parking once we remove the first floor, former Scott Shop Triner or Love's first floor space. All right. Thanks. Any other questions for the petitioner? Going once, twice. All right. Seeing no more. Um, as you can see, we have not a full board tonight. Um, we may have a full board next month. We may not. Um, would you like us to proceed or would you like to delay till next month for, for a, a possibility of a full board? We'd like to proceed. Okay. Then we will pull back to this side of the table. And is there any discussion and or motions? Mr. Klatt. I'll make a motion to approve the variance request. Is there a second? Mr. Gavin, I saw his hand jump up first. Go ahead, Mr. Klatt. Number one, thank you for your interest in Royal Oak. I think this is an exciting adaptive reuse project. And I think there's practical difficulty due to the modern office environment, maybe the fact that our ordinance is a bit out of touch due to that. As Mr. Reddy mentioned, when I looked at that, it's a, a ton of open space in this plant, a ton of common space. When you look at that square footage of 17,563 subtracted from the overall, divided by 225, I come up with 129 spaces, which is shy, or short of or less than the 132 that you need for providing. So for that reason, I'll be in support. I think you meet the parking needs. All right, Mr. Gavin, anything to add? Uh, just that, <laughs> I don't know that, uh, you know, these sites on Woodward with the you know, kind of the narrow long lots and, and you know, parking is continually a problem down there, uh, down that entire corridor. I, I almost suspect that, you know, in order to meet our current ordinance, the only way with this, this building as it is, is to demolish it and rebuild it, you know, and I just, that's not really feasible um, for, for most uh, projects like this. So I, I, uh, I echo Mr. Klatt's comments and I, I think this is a good reuse of, uh, of an existing facility and uh, it will greatly benefit the city. So I'm, I'm all for it. Okay. Is there any other comments? Mr. Reddy. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that, uh, you know, while a lot of Royal Oak doesn't have great public transit availability, the Woodward Corridor does have really great public transit uh, by bus. And uh, the bus stop is like just two minutes away from this location. So I think uh, many people will be able to go by bus without parking. Yeah. All right. Uh, Ms. Zukin. Um I think other things to consider are that if this is not retail, there's going to be a lot less congestion of those driveways. It's going to be a positive impact on traffic on Woodward. Um, you're not going to have people going in and out as often as you would in a retail space. And also, um, Mr. Lennon's comment about the company not wanting to hurt itself by not having enough spaces. We use that argument a lot on commercial properties along Woodward, you know, let them fail if, if they want to, if there's not enough parking. And in this case, I think we have more than enough parking and I don't think they would make this move if they thought they didn't have enough parking. All right. Uh, any comments from Mr. Moore, Ms. Robinson or Ms. Grant? Yes, Ms. Robinson. Um, I'm in favor. I think it's a great project that's going in on Woodward. I don't think parking's really going to be a problem. Things have changed. Things have changed in how we do business in offices now. So I think this is a great, great use of the property. Mr. Moore. Um, I'll echo that. I think this is a, a great use of this. And I know that um, it has been kind of a priority to revitalize some of these vacant spaces along Woodward. And I think that this is a good start to that. Anything from you, Ms. Grant, or no, you're... 
Um, since everybody wants to make a comment, I can make a comment too. Um, I agree that, you know, things have changed. There's about 10 parking spaces out of the hundred being used at my company right now. So I really don't see the need for so many parking spaces for this building. And I too will agree, um, albeit for their use, parking will be fine if this change in the future to another office, maybe it's another problem. But again, as was stated, you uh, live or die by the parking required here on, on uh, Woodward. Everyone sort of needs it who's off of Woodward. So if you're going into a space that doesn't have enough parking, uh, you might not want to be going to Woodward. But as you can see, they, they, they claim to have plenty of extra parking that's required. And uh, I do agree the future, no one knows what's going to be uh, uh, going on with people or not owning cars or car sharing or transit or, or, or healthy biking and walking uh, with a multi-use uh, zone throughout Woodward. So I, I think, I don't think they'll have a parking issue. Uh, so I have no problem with uh, uh, supporting this and uh, them dealing with their practical difficulties of Woodward location. And with that, we will move to a vote. We will start at the bottom. Ms. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Clatt. Yes. Mr. Reddy. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Moore. Yes. Ms. Sukin. Yes. Mr. Gavin. Yes. And I too shall vote yes. So the motion passes unanimously for the variances. Congratulations. And we look forward to your uh, new uh, state-of-the-art office location when it does open in 2023. Like you got it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you I for your patience. I appreciate everyone's time tonight. Thank you again. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. All righty. Is there any other business, Mr. Murphy? Uh, yes. Simply to point out that next month we need to hold a closed session starting at 6.30, just prior to the regular meeting, at, which starts at 7.00. Uh, and that okay. will be related to a uh, discussion on some pending litigation of a previous case. So we'll have a legal counsel here to to discuss that with you. So look look forward to to meeting at at six thirty. Okay. All righty. Uh, with that, uh, you said there's no public comment. Nope. A, who's left here wants to make any public comment? No, nope. we appreciate everybody's patience uh, today in the in the good job uh, various attempts that we had for a meeting. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. We we got it done, and that uh, pat on the back there for you and <laughs> Judy working together. Yes, Thank Judy you. did a wonderful job as always. And, and everyone here on the board being patient and waiting for the different uh, Zoom links to, and and able to come in. Yeah. So, well, yeah. which kind of leads. To a, an, an obvious point that the state legislature is not moving forward with any legislation to allow us to continue to have remote meetings. So we will have to commence in-person meetings starting in January. You do have a virtual meeting scheduled for next month. Um, I'm going to go under the presumption that we can handle that smoothly. And then we just end up seeing everybody in January in person. All right. That sounds good. So then, is there any, who's doing the mystery motion for tonight? Anyone? Mr. Moore. New. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> How about we let our, our newest member uh, yes. jump in there and, and make the, the support? I second it. Excellent. All right, there we go. All right, all in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Again, oh. thank you very much for your patience this evening. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Judy. Thank Thanks, you. Joseph. Thank you. Have a good night. You're welcome. Everyone. Bye. Right. Good night. Have a great Thanksgiving, everyone. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And opening so, day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>